don't have a lot of fear, to be honest with you, man. It's just, uh, as long as I'm on this earth, I don't worry too much. They beat me to a pole. I mean, they, they beat me pretty bad. I mean, I was a nine-year-old kid. Asking that question is kind of like asking a fish, like, how do you deal with swimming your whole life? Like, it was just my environment. It's what I grew up in. I was speaking to the inmates who had just graduated from high school, and, you know, some of them the same thing. You know, I know you're in jail, but you can't let this define your future. You have to have a deep-rooted emotional reason as to why you want to do something, because if you don't have a deep-rooted emotional reason why, once you face adversity, that good idea is going to quickly turn into a bad idea. My thing is giving back, you know, how can I give back? How can I serve? How can I open up the door for somebody else? Hello, this is Remy Adeleke, author of Transform, and you're listening to The Wild Initiative. Put down your latte and pull on your boots. Our culture needs people that are leaders and not people that are waiting for somebody else to show them how to do it. Those fields of tofu, that was formerly habitat for wildlife. You're killing off wildlife by being a vegetarian just as much as a hunter when he kills a deer. I'm like, well, you see that bush right there? (laughs) There's your bathroom. (laughs) My dad wears a Levi jacket. He sits in front of a sagebrush and he tells me the best camo is hold still. Not to Donnie Vincent this, but be relentless in everything you do. Don't crap out. Go back to the truck with excuses or whatever. Okay, assume I get a deer. How do I cut it up to fit into a Honda Civic? Just get outside. Just get outside and go. Because once you do, it's all gravy from there. Hey, this is Zach Griffith. This is Hannah Barron. This is Jason Phelps of Phelps Game Calls. Hey, guys, this is Cody Rich from the Rich Outdoors podcast. What's up, guys? This is Chad Mendez. You're listening to The Wild Initiative. Hey, yo, welcome to episode 118 of The Wild Initiative. The Wild Initiative is brought to you in part by the Go Wild app. Y'all, the Go Wild app is the fastest growing social media and activity tracking platform for all of y'all who love the outdoors. Now, one of my favorite parts of the Go Wild app, except for the competition over points, is the activity tracking, specifically the archery tracking. Now, if y'all just want to use the app straight, you can start the tracking. For each set, it'll have you put in the distance you're shooting at, the number of arrows you're shooting, and the eventual spread of each set. And it packages your whole archery practice into one nice, neat little box that you can then share and review later. What's even cooler is Go Wild has this really awesome integration with some of the newer Garmin watches. It's really similar to the app, but you get so much more added data, and it automatically tracks when you lose an arrow, so it can do things like match your heart rate to each arrow loosed in a set. Not only can you track archery, but you can track all sorts of other activities, such as scouting, hiking, or even hunting, so you can go into the app, feel the vibrations, and and really relive the moment that your heart rate spiked when you drew back on that big bucker bull. You can check out all the activity tracking I've done as well as download the app at thewildinitiative.com slash go wild. Also, y'all want to give a huge shout out to Sawyer Products for their continued support of the podcast. I use their stuff on pretty much every single one of my hunts. So y'all make sure to check them out at sawyer.com. And finally, I'll make sure to head on over and check out my Patreon page. You can find that at patreon.com slash the wild initiative. There's some really awesome options there for you to join the wild initiative team. Help this podcast continue to grow, continue to help me release this content week after week. And there are really some amazing rewards that uh, you get in return for contributing monthly to the podcast. Stuff like, I know y'all love this ad free episodes so we can get right to the good stuff and you don't have to listen to me ramble for a while but there's lots of other good options in there as well so make sure y'all check that out uh you can find a link to that on the support page on my website or go straight there at patreon.com slash the wild initiative All right, y'all, getting into today's episode. I know this is a podcast that focuses on hunting, fishing, conservation, and the outdoors, but there's one other thing. It's my podcast, and I get to interview who I want. And I think y'all will find this guest to be really interesting, really inspiring, and I think he's got some messages and lessons that can really apply to us as we strive to spend time in the outdoors. So for today's podcast, podcast i'm talking with remy adeleke he is author of the book transformed he is a former navy seal he's an actor he's a public speaker and just really an awesome motivating guy i really think y'all will enjoy this episode so without further ado episode 118 with remy adeleke 
Remy, thanks so much for taking the time to hop on the podcast with me. Hey, no, thanks for having me. I'd love if you could just kind of start out, um, just maybe give a, a super basic, you know, we'll get into a lot of the details of your, your, your story in, in a sec, but just kind of a, a basic introduction of, of who you are. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my name's Remy Aleke. Um, currently, I am uh, an actor. Uh, I've been in a few films uh, and TV shows collectively. Um, I was in uh, Transformers and also in, I um, uh, just finished up a film that's coming out on Netflix in, uh, in, in December, I believe. It's uh, Michael Bay's next film. And then I've um, been on some TV shows, Seal Team, and and uh, done some commercial work. And, and I'm a writer, so I wrote my own book by myself. Then I have a ghostwriter, co-writer, so I'm not just an author. <laughs> I'm a writer as well. And uh, I write I write films and, and, and uh, screenplays. Um, so people call it films, but in the professional realm, we call them screenplays. I'm a screenplay writer. And I'm also helping uh, to uh, co-write my mother's book as well, which is a prequel to my book. Um, uh, I'm a father, husband. I've been married for going on, uh, uh, let's see, going on nine years. And uh, uh, you got three boys and uh, uh, Kate and Caleb Carter, who I love, to, I love with all my heart. <laughs> and uh, yeah, man. So that's kind of where I'm at now. Former Navy SEAL, spent 13 years in the military. Majority, majority of that time was spent special operations as a SEAL. And, um, and yeah. So you have a, a very interesting background to say the least you were not uh originally born in the united states correct no no, no. i was born in uh, western africa I lived in nigeria for the first five years of my life and uh so what what brings you from western africa to the united states <laughs> yeah well you know my dad he was a uh, he was a well-known nigerian engineer philanthropist businessman he uh engineered one of the first man-made islands in the world and it, it, it still exists to this day the island is uh, known as banana island now but it was uh when my dad was developing it it was known as lagoon development project um uh, but due to uh, a lot of corruption in nigeria uh then and even now uh, the Nigerian government decided to strip my father of his most valuable asset, which was the island. And at that time, my dad had invested millions and millions of dollars of his own money into it. And uh, my dad, you know, went to go fight them and uh, in, in the middle of fighting them in court. And uh, he died. Uh, so when he died, uh, we went from, from rich to poor because uh, the Nigerian government, you know, they, they were able to win the case, obviously. And, and with that came, you know, the seizing of, of his most valuable asset that he had dumped all his money into. And uh, so we had absolutely nothing. And my mom, she was American. Uh, she was and is, I say. Uh, she uh, she met my dad in, in, in uh, New York City at the Met Metropolitan Museum of Natural History. And uh, I tell people all the time, my mom's story and dad's story is the real coming to America story because here my dad <laughs> was this uh, this royal chief in the Yoruba tribe, which is uh, you know it's a prominent tribe in Nigeria. So not only did he have um, physical wealth, but he also had had wealth from from his title as uh, as a chief uh, in, in 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 Nigerian culture. And and so here my mom is marrying this this prince, so to speak, and uh, and she was whisked off to uh, to Nigeria, and uh, she was immersed in this very uh, opulent. And, uh, lifestyle and traveled the world and we had cars and nannies and all this stuff. So I say all that to say um, when my dad died, my mom being American was just like, there's no way I'm raising my two boys um, here in Africa. And she permanently uh, relocated us to uh, uh, to, to um, New York City. And uh, I grew up in the Bronx. So that's how I ended up here. So how old uh, were you and your brother when uh, you moved out to New York? I was five. My brother was six. This happened in 1987. So how you know i mean you're you're still pretty young at that age but uh, do you remember much of that initial move do you remember much of your life uh back in africa um not, you know it's a little bit yes and no um you know my mom did a, a, a fantastic job fantastic job of masking the reality of what had happened um i tell people that all the time um so so you know we didn't i, I couldn't really no, and I mean, yes and no. I mean, yeah, man, my mom just did a really good job. I mean, I, maybe this will help put it into perspective. So when my father died, I, I'll never forget it. My mom placed my brother on her right side and me on her left side, and there's this red chair, and, and, and she essentially told us that our, her, you know, our dad is dead, and, and she had said it in such a calming and easy way that we didn't 
we just went back to playing as if nothing happened because my mom was just such a master at, you know, composing herself. And I know she, she wasn't trying to be dis- deceived, uh, you know, she wasn't trying to deceive us in any way. You know, she just, pre- at the, looking back, I know she was trying to protect us because she knew that if we broke down, then she would break down. If she broke down, we would break down more and it would just create this never ending cycle. So I say all that to say that my mom, um, she mastered the art of, of, of masking the reality to protect her two boys. And so um, the transition wasn't hard at all. You know, the best analogy I can give us, it was as though my mom created this movie set and on a movie set everything seemed good (laughs) but when you walked off the movie set into the Bronx you know the environment that we grew up in you know and or when we were exposed to things that um, my mom tried to protect us from then then that's when reality set in. So uh, you know you grew up in the Bronx in you know in New York Um, your mom tried to put together this as you call it like as you said it the movie set you know this, this very ideal, safe, healthy environment at home. But the second you're off that movie set, you know, real world comes at you pretty quick, doesn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. 100%, man. It's, uh, yeah, man, it was, you know, I remember there were times when my mom didn't have enough food to feed herself. She had just enough food to feed me and my brother. There were times when, you know, I would walk with her as I got older. And this is when reality began to set in. But, you know, we would go to the rent office and she would have to ask for extra few days to pay the rent because she didn't have the money. Um, there were times when, you know, a lot of times when, you know, my mom would, would have to hand, hand us, my brother and I, a big bar of ivory soap and tell us, hey, I don't have enough money for you guys to do laundry. So uh, uh, wash your underwears and socks in the sink and hang them on the uh, shower pole. So, um, and, and then, you know, obviously growing up in the Bronx, walking down the streets and, and you know, the crack epidemic was huge, was, was really, really big at the time when I was growing up, uh, late eighties, early nineties. And, you know, so seeing crackheads on the street, crack, crap, you know, um, needles on the ground, crackheads in the park, you know, drug dealers on the corners. I mean, you know, um, people getting jumped, you know, people getting robbed, you know, I, you know, I, it became a, it became normal life to me because it's, you know, what I, what I saw on a daily basis. I mean, that's, it's, it's really crazy when you're young, you know, you don't notice these things quite as much, but then when you're older, you kind of look back and I, you know, I've, I've done this a few times where, you know, I know my parents were going through some rough stuff and they were protecting, protecting me from things. And, you know, there was, things were a little bit different. I knew something was off, but I didn't, I never, as a kid, realized the full extent of what my parents were going through yeah. to provide for me. Yeah. And then as an adult now, I look back and those pieces kind of start coming together, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like, it's like the puzzle, you know, it's like when, you know, things make sense, especially as you become a parent, you know, and, and, and there are things that, you know, you know, I try to protect my kids from, you know, not, 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 not as, as I can't really compare them to what my mom was trying to protect me from, but, you know, uh, so looking, seeing how I'm trying to protect my kids from certain things. And as I reflect back on my life as a young, young boy, now I kind of see, I kind of see the parallel and I kind of see, Oh, that's what my mom was doing. That's why she was doing what she was doing. That's why I hated her. And hated the decision she made because <laughs> you know but uh, it was all for my good you know i'm sure i'm sure as a, a parent and you know knowing the stuff that you went through it's got to be it's got to be a little bit scary you know knowing you know knowing what's out there and having having kids and you can raise them the best you can and you can but you can only you know, trust God and trust in how you've raised them that they'll make the right choices. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, um, I don't have a lot of fear to be honest with you, man. It's just, uh, because, you know, I know one of the reasons why I ended up going down the road. I, I went down, I'm sure we'll touch on this. Cause you know, sorry, I, I didn't have a, I didn't have a father in my life to really, you know, you know, to, to, to put his hand on the thing on my forehead and tell me to stop, you know, uh, once I got into my, my, my early teenage years, um, there was only but so much my mother could do uh, because, you know, I, I got some size on me. So, <laughs> so, so I, you know, I started to, she couldn't spank me anymore. It affect me. Um, uh, but yeah, I say all I have to say, um, now as a father, you know, I, I don't worry as much about my boys because I know I'm in their life and, you know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, hopefully I'll be here, you know, for a long period of time, but I know that as long as I am here, I'm going to be guiding them and still those principles in, in them for them to be the, the, you know, good men, you know, or, you know, honorable men, stand up men who take responsibility for their actions and do what they're supposed to do and have have integrity. And so, uh, I don't worry as long as I'm on this earth, I don't worry too much. <laughs> 
I think I would probably worry more if I died, but I think if I died, it wasn't having uh, there's not much worrying of this. So I can't worry about it. <laughs> I'm gonna have to worry. <laughs> Hey, it's not not a bad place to be when yeah, not, right. uh, you know wherever you wherever you're at, you don't have to worry. No, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, it, you know it's funny. It just it makes me makes me think of a verse that I have I have tattooed on the the back of my arm. Just you know, therefore we do not worry for though the outer man is decaying, the inner man is being renewed day by day. Well, momentary light affliction produces for us an eternal yeah. weight of glory far beyond all comparison and yeah. you know i think it's Corinthians. yep yep i think you uh i think you may know just a little bit about uh a little bit about affliction and trials mm-hmm. and struggles just uh, oh, you, absolutely. you've uh you've like like we said you know you've lived getting in a little bit more into your history you know um what tell us a little bit more about what it was like growing up in the bronx uh as a as a kid I mean, it, it, I mean there, were, there were some good sides and there were some bad sides. We lived in a uh, community called uh, Fordham Hill Oval. And so it was like this is a co-op. And, you know, inside the co-op, you know, um, there were some families who were middle class in that co-op. Um, but as soon as you step outside of that co-op, I mean, you're in, you're in the West side of the Bronx. I mean, you're, I mean, it's, it's a really, really, really rough environment. I mean, you can't leave your car on the street. If you do, it's going to get broken into radio is going to get stolen. Uh, you know, your wheels might get stolen. I mean, I mean, my mom, when she had a car, she eventually got rid of it because it was too expensive to keep. But when she, when she had a car, I mean, it, I, I, I want to say about, it got broken into about four or five times, you know? Uh, and then finally she, she was like, All right, I got to park this on the street. I got to park this in a parking lot in the parking lot was way too expensive she can afford that so she eventually got rid of the car um so you know just dealing with things like that you know dealing with you know the i don't want to say fear but i would walk down the street and see people get jumped you know and 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 i got jumped uh, i remember i was about uh I can't remember about 10, 11 years old. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe I was a nine or 10 years old and I was on the basketball court and, you know, me and this kid, we were playing one-on-one basketball and I was a little knucklehead kid and he was, and I'm just talking junk to him like a nine year old kid does. And, you know, uh, he finally got fed up with me talking junk cause I was winning the game and he went and got his, his uncle who just got out of prison and his, uh, and his 19 year old brother and they came and they beat, they beat me to a pole. I mean, they, they beat me pretty bad. And yeah, I was a nine year old kid, you know? So, um, you know, I was, that was the environment I grew up in, you know, and, and, you know, riding the trains and at the time, you know, the, 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 the gangs, um, kind of, you know, blew up. And, and so, you know, it was, it was the saying, you know, when you ride the train, be careful because you don't want to get a buck 50. And what that meant was, you know, the, the, the cost a dollar 50 cent to ride the trains. And, and, but what gangs would do is gangs for initiation, they would point out a random person on the train, go up to that person and slash their face. Uh, and so, you know, we had that saying, you know, don't go away. When you get on the train, be careful about getting that buck 50, which meant, meant you know, getting your face slashed. Um, so, you know, just getting on a train or having to kind of be attentive. But at the end of the day, um, growing up in that environment really prepared me for, for my future in the SEAL teams, I truly believe. You know, it, it, it taught me how to trust people and how not to trust people. <laughs> it taught me um, how to discern, essentially. Um, it also taught me, it also gave me like street smarts and wisdom, you know, that I can apply, you know, going down range later in my life. And uh, there's so many different principles that you know, it made me hard. You know, it really, really made me hard. It, it, it toughened me up in a way that I don't think any other environment could have toughened me up. So, you know, when I eventually did get to boot camp and, 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 and SEAL training, you know, I could take the name call and I could take the beat down sessions. I could take it all because I, that was my whole life. <laughs> so it wasn't an issue for me. Um, so yeah, again, it was a rough environment, but um, that environment prepared me so much for my future in special operations, and also as a man, and 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 you know, as as a protector, and 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 as a father, and and a husband, you know. So so I'm grateful for it. So how you know, in this environment, how do you how do you deal with that? Like what you know. Th- it seems like, you know, that can, an environment like that can, can really just take you to a, a bad place. Oh, man, it's, it's, it's kind of like asking, um, uh, I'm trying to think of an analogy, but I think, uh, <laughs> asking that question is kind of like asking a fish, like, how do you deal with swimming your whole life? Like, you know, like, I mean, that must suck where you just have to constantly move and swim in the water your whole <laughs> life. You know what I mean? But that's your, your environment. Um, um, so it was just my environment. It's what I grew up in, you know? So it's like, how do I deal with it? You deal with it. 
Um, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's, it, you can't, there, there's no outlet. There is no, I'm going to run to Manhattan and live in a yeah. high rise apartment. You know, there is no escape, you know, and the mindset is you'll never get out of this environment. Um, so if anything, if there's anything you got to battle with, it's, it's this notion that you'll never make it out or you're, you, you can't be anything other than a drug dealer or a rapper or an athlete, which I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being an athlete, but that's just typically the notion, uh, for a lot of kids in inner cities. Um, um, so how did I deal with it? I just dealt with it. It was just, it was just life for me. It was just part of my life. It was just the way I, I grew up. I didn't know anything else, you know, especially having left Africa at such a young age. Um, and my mom being, you know, doing a great job at our transition, you know, for the most part, you know, the Bronx was, was my life. That's, it's such a crazy thing because, you know, it's, it, you know, it, it's, you kind of like, Oh man, I wish I'd remember what it was like, you know, growing up. I, I mean, effectively as royalty, yeah. Uh, in Africa, but then also you kind of think it's like, well, it's almost better that you don't have those those super vivid memories of that because then the whole time you'd be comparing it to to where you're at then, and I, I could imagine that would result in some bitterness and some anger. Yeah, and then also you know on top of that, man, like I have my dad was married before he married my mom, like years before he married my mom. I think my uh, he had been divorced for ten years when he met my mom, and um. So I have siblings, like half siblings that are like 15, 16 years older than me. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and a lot of, and, and all of them lived a completely different life than I did. I mean, they were, they all lived privileged lives. They all went to boarding school in London. Um, they all went to the top universities in London. Um, they all were set up for life, you know, from, from, you know, because, you know, they, because they had the education, because they had the connections that my father had and all that. Um, and, and they are completely different people than I am, you know, um, um, not disrespecting in any way, but they are just completely different, you know? Um, but, you know, looking at them and then looking at my life, I'm so glad I, I was raised the way they were raised and I didn't have the things that they had because, you know, going the route that I did, you know, it really made me the man who I am today. Like, like, everything I had to work for everything um that I have you know nothing was handed to me my my older siblings everything was handed to them <laughs> and so you know the fact that I had to work hard it really instilled it instilled the mindset of hard work and perseverance and and you know anything is, is possible if you if you put your mind to it and just grind you know um so I'm grateful that I did not have the life that they had it's what what would you tell someone you know maybe there's someone maybe the situation's not exactly the same but someone is in a situation similar to that in that you know they don't think they have any options they think they're trapped where they they're at where they don't they may not see a bright future they're you know they're like you know i've i've got a bad option and a worse option and and that's all i can do what what encouragement would you give someone like that yeah you know i would essentially say you know never let your current environment define your future um, again, that was my trap. That was, you know, I, I never thought that I could be anything outside of, of, of what I had known. Um, but obviously that, that was a lie. Um, so, you know, one thing I try to tell young people, cause I, I you know, I, I volunteer with nonprofits and I, you know, I was at Rikers Island jail, uh, uh back earlier, earlier in, in June, uh, speaking to the inmates who had just graduated from high school. And, you know, some of them, same thing, you know, I know you're in jail, but you can't let this define your future. Uh, you, you know, p pick yourself up, figure out a way to, 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 to create a better life for yourself. So that's something I just try to tell them, you know, and, 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 and I'm in the right position to tell them because I'm speaking from example, you know, I'm not speaking from, I'm not that person that, that grew up in Beverly Hills and now I'm going to jail and saying, and never did anything wrong. And now I'm going to jail and saying, Hey, it doesn't matter where you start. You could, you could finish right wherever you, you know, if you put your mind to it, I, you know, I'm, I, I lived it, you know, so, so I, not only do I go there and I tell them, but I show them through my life, you know, through example that, um, you can rise out of this. It's just a decision. It's just a choice. You know, you have to make the choice as to whether you want to rise out of this or whether you want to stay in, in, in stay in a cycle that you've uh, known your whole life. So how does this kid from the Bronx suddenly become the, this special ops SEAL team member doing, doing crazy stuff overseas and, so, I mean, I don't imagine that was the straightest line getting, uh, <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Um, uh, it, you know, a seed was planted. 
back in, I want to say 95, I, I saw a movie called The Rock and that was the first time I was exposed to Navy SEAL. So um, um, that seed was planted back in 1995, but obviously it, it kind of it kind of uh, was hidden within me um, and, and buried and forgotten uh, for, for many years. Cause you know, it was kind of like, you know, when I think I was about 15 at the time, it's kind of like saying now I'm gonna be the president of the United States one day, chance <laughs> that happened to slip to none, right? So when I was 15 and, and saw this film about Navy SEALs or with Navy, Navy SEALs, and I said I was going to be a Navy SEAL, it was kind of like, it was completely far-fetched. So that, that little seed was planted within me back at 15. But then fast forward to when I was 19, I was at the height of, of, of my legal activities. I was bringing in thousands of uh, thousands and thousands of dollars a week, um, selling drugs, running illegal scams. I mean, I was just making tons of money. And uh, long story short, I got involved in a deal with a drug dealer that went bad. I sold some products that were supposed to last for a certain amount of time. Those products only last for a fraction of that time. And he essentially threatened my life. Life. So, you know, after I made him his money back, I made the decision, I'm getting out of this game. I'm not going to do the legal thing anymore. And then fast forward six months later, um, you know, I was just laying in my bed and I heard this voice speak to me, tell me I needed to get out of the Bronx. And, you know, uh, I, at that time, I thought it was, you know, my subconscious bothering me. But in retrospect, I truly believe it was the voice of God. And, and uh, you know, I battled with that voice. I battled with that idea for a few minutes. And finally, I looked around in my room and I, and I said to myself, you know, Remy, what else do you have left? Uh, you're, you're about to turn 20. Uh, yeah, you graduated from high school, but, you know, everything that you've tried to do has, has amounted to nothing. And, and what are you going to do? Keep, you know, sleeping in your mother's bedroom until uh, 11 o'clock in the morning and then getting up and, and, and watching the TV until it's time to, you know, go to sleep and do it all over again. So um, I made a decision to get out of my bed and then I went down the street I grew up on and I went to, to the first, I went to the Marine Corps recruiter's office and uh, I sat there for about 15 minutes. No one showed up. So I got up, uh, walked out of the Marine Corps recruiter's office and I walked into the Navy recruiter's office and it was a blessing that it happened that way because uh, uh, there were two things that the Navy recruiter did who I met, Tiana Reyes. The first thing, she had me do a practice test to make sure I was academically qualified to join the military, which I passed and showed I was. And then um, she ran my background check and when she ran my background, my criminal record, she found out I had two warrants out for my arrest. Uh, I had a warrant in New York and a warrant in New Jersey. And uh, I got up and I got ready to run out of the office. And she said, where are you going? I said, I'm getting out of here. I don't feel like going to jail today. And, and she said, don't worry about that. You know, I'll cover you. Just come back tomorrow and, and, and some nice pants and, and a nice shirt. And so I did. And uh, she was in her dress uniform. She took me to both judges, the judge in New York and New Jersey, advocated on my behalf to get my record expunged. 9-11 had just taken place about nine months earlier. So both judges were sympathetic. They saw my decision to join the Navy as patriotic, and they both unanimously expunged my record. And then she, uh, she went a step further and uh, fudged out all the paperwork in the Navy to sneak me into the Navy. And that's how I got to the Navy. And uh, uh, that, that, I mean, that changed. That's where it all started. That's where it started as far as the Navy, not special operations, but the Navy. And then when I got to boot camp, there was a, Na a Navy SEAL came to my uh, boot camp division and he put on a presentation, uh, which was a video uh, showing what SEALs did, showed guys jumping from planes and scuba diving and, and you know, uh, just running around with cool guns and just doing all of this cool stuff and, I'm getting paid to do it too, which was, you know, <laughs> added benefit. And uh, that's when that dream that I had, you know, years earlier after I watched The Rock kind of reemerged within me. And I was like, man, I want to be a SEAL. I don't want to, I don't want to do anything else in the Navy, but I want to be a frogman. But I was totally unqualified. Uh, you know, I didn't meet any of the qualifications to be, a, to even show, to try out the SEAL training. <laughs> <laughs> well, know, there was yeah. one uh, very important qualification. <laughs> if I, uh, <laughs> if I remember yeah. correctly that you definitely did not have, uh, yeah. what, what was that main qualification? Uh, I couldn't swim in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I couldn't swim in. I, I, uh, I didn't have the academic scores. I was super skinny, uh, could barely do a push up. I mean, I was, I was, it was just a swim. It was a combination of things, man. I was like, I was told I was unqualified in every single way to be a SEAL. I mean, as a matter of fact, when you look back at it, there's no reason why I should have ended up getting, a, a, you know, becoming a SEAL. Um, and and, this, and I tell people all the time, you know, when you when you have a dream, you know, it's called the dream for a reason because it's, it's, it's going to be hard to achieve. And uh, when you have a dream, most likely you're going to have, you know, uh, deficiencies as it relates to that dream. Some deficiencies might be small, some deficiencies might be large. But um, if you want to reach that dream, you have to be willing to do 
the extra, extra, extra hard work, not the extra hard work, but the extra, extra, extra hard work over in order to overcome those deficiencies. And so, you know, that's what I did, man. I didn't, I didn't look at my deficiencies and say it's impossible, which if you looked at it on paper, if you looked at my qualifications on paper, you would say, okay, this guy is, is, is totally unqualified and, and, and it is impossible that he will ever be a SEAL um, because technically it was. But uh, I did the work and uh, within a year of checking into my first command, I was checking out and uh, I had met every qualification uh, that, uh, uh, to get into SEAL training. And, uh, you know, I got in and uh, uh, in less than a year with swimming, academics, push-up test, passed all of the, the physical stuff and uh, went to SEAL training. Um, uh, I got kicked out halfway through the first time I was there, but I went back and I made it through and uh, became a SEAL, man. So, um, yeah. That's just, I mean, that's so amazing. You know, we, we were talking earlier and, you know, I kind of told you that really the, the goal behind this podcast is to inspire people to chase what they want um to go you know to to stretch their limits to push beyond them to really yeah. you know push past what they think they can do or what other people say they could do you know i mean it's you know not nearly on the level that you're at but you know yeah. i'm like i mean i grew up as as a computer nerd in southern california you know i played dungeons and dragons and <laughs> games all the time man and just yeah. one day i'm like I want to be in the outdoors. I want to, I want to learn to hunt and, um, you know, I want to do all these crazy things and, you know, and so I did it and I just, I want other people to be inspired by that. And what you did, you know, you, that's amazing. Like, yeah. you were, as you said, you were completely unqualified for, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a military guy, but are, you know, the skills arguably the most intense training out there. I mean, correct me yeah. if I'm wrong, but no, yeah, you're right. It's considered the toughest military training known to man. I mean, the class, the class that I, I eventually graduated with, you know, started out with 270 guys, you know, and uh, only 29 of us graduated, you know, so, and that's the way it is. Every class, the attrition rate is like anywhere between 80 and 90%. So, um, so yeah, it, 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 it sucks. <laughs> it straight up sucks, you know? So you're right on. And, you know, going back and talking about what your recruiter did for you, yeah. that's, it's amazing the effect one single person yeah. can have on a life because it, and it's just beyond the effect she had on your life because now look at what, where you're at and what you're doing. I yeah, mean, exactly. Yeah. If nothing, how many, how many speaking engagements are, are, I mean, aside from this podcast, how many speaking engagements are, are you, are you doing just today? <laughs> yeah, well, well, I did, I did three yesterday. I got, uh, uh, obviously I got one tonight in about, uh, about 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, I have, uh, you know, I did uh, this month. I mean, just number wise, I probably did um, about August. Well, I say this month, I probably did about, eight in August, you know? So, uh, and it's the September 2nd and, and I've already done to, at the time it'll be four. <laughs> I, I mean, so. you know, just looking at that, how many thousands of lives have you touched yeah. and how exponential is that just yeah. from that one act that recruiter did? And yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing. She effectively, I mean, saved your life. No, absolutely. And that's why, you know, my, my, my thing is now, you know, I is giving back, you know, is giving back. How can I give back? How can I serve? How can I open up the door for somebody else? You know, and, and, you know, that may look different than, you know, sneaking somebody into the Navy. That might be, you know, you know, a speaking engagement as you, as you, as you shared or a word of encouragement, or, you know, maybe loaning somebody some money um, so that they could, you know, get to where they need to get or given money, you know, so they can get to where they need to be. So that's what my whole life is about right now. So, um, a little bit of a departure from your story, but, uh, just because I'm super curious and I think it's pretty cool. I, to be honest, I'm really interested in hearing a little bit about your training, what, what that's like, like, what does, I mean, what is SEAL training? Like what, because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not, I mean, the most intense training in the world. What is, what's like some of the stuff that involves? 
Uh, you know, it's all mental, man. For the most part, it's all, uh, it's all, uh, it's all hundred uh, percent mental, man. Um, they, they, they're essentially trying to, what they're trying to do is they're trying to weed out the weed, not physically, but the weak mentally, because every single guy that shows up to seal training, uh, he has what it takes physically to make it. Otherwise he wouldn't have been accepted into the program. Um, but the question is, do they have what it takes mentally to make it through the program? Um, and so, um, that's what it boils down to, man, at the end of the day, you know, and, and, and they, they play mind games. They play mind games. They put you through exercises that push you mentally, um, push you to places where you've never been pushed before. Um, long swims, very long swims, long runs, very long runs, um, beat down sessions. <laughs> I mean, you name it, they throw, they throw everything at you. They throw literally throw everything. I, they, I mean, surf torture where they lay you down in cold water, uh, until guys get up and quit. I mean, my lowest core temperature at one point during one surf torture was 88.7 degrees, which is, you know, deadly. And, uh, they rewarm me, uh, it took them about 45 minutes to, after they went through their medical rewarming requirements. And after they rewarmed me, they took me right back out and said, Hey, do you, uh, um, do you want to, um, quit or do you want to go back in? And I said, I'm going back in. So it, it sucks. It, it sucks. That's what it boils down to. It sucks, man. So what, how, like, you know, I mean, this is probably, this is a, I know this is a loaded question, but like what, cause there had to be times where you're sitting there and, and you wanted to quit. And you, I mean, you obviously had that mental strength to, to get through it. But yeah. what, what goes through your mind in that moment? How, like, what do you, how do you handle that? Well, uh, the, the idea of quitting never popped in my mind at all. Um, uh, that's one, but, uh, how did I handle? Yeah. So I didn't need to handle it. I mean, I, what, what, I think I dealt with it before it would come up. And what I mean by that is, you know, I tell people all the time, um, you have to have a deep rooted emotional reason as to why you want to do something. Um, because if you don't have a deep rooted emotional reason why, um, once you face adversity, um, that good idea is going to quickly turn into a bad idea. And to a lot of guys to show up to seal training, all it is is a good idea. Like it's like, it's a good idea to be a seal. It's a good idea to, you know, shoot cool guns. It's a good idea to be part of an elite unit. It's a good idea to travel the world. Um, but once they get, once they get into that, you know, that cold water or once they're enduring a long run, then that good idea quickly turns into a bad idea, you know? And so for me, you know, my deep rooted emotional reason why as to why I wanted to make it was I had nothing left, you know, uh, it was just that simple for me. I had nothing left. I had failed in life. I had failed with so many other things in life that I can't fail anymore. I have nothing left. And, and that's what drove me every single uh, moment of the day. And, and so that's why that, uh, that idea of quitting never popped in my mind because I, I just knew that there was no plan B. You know, I had burnt my boats um, uh, and stormed the beach. Um, so, yeah, man. I think that's such an important point to reiterate is just you have to know your why and it has, yeah. to, be, it has to be more than, you know, just because. It has to yeah. be more than because it's cool. Yeah. There has to be some connection for you to what you're doing for, for anything that's hard, for anything that's a challenge or where you'll face adversity, whether, I mean, you know, once again, like top of the, <laughs> top of the chain there, like SEAL training yeah. or, you know, a bit further down, something like going on uh, into the outdoors for, for days at a time where you're, you know, hiking, hiking these, giant elevations and and just destroying your body one day at a time yeah. but uh and you have to decide it's such an important thing you have to decide before you start before yeah. you're ever out there that mm -hmm. quitting is not an option no 100 percent, man and it applies it applies to every aspect of life like you brought up you know it applies to hunting it applies to you know and even now as the writer you know that applies to, to to me as a writer writing is hard a lot of people don't realize that you know sitting down and and writing a book takes a lot of work you know it takes a lot of mental energy it's not you know, you're not exerting yourself physically in any way but it's a lot of it takes a lot of mental exertion and you know it's easy to quit it's easy to say okay you know what this this chapter is not working and it has hasn't been working or this scene is not working and it hasn't been working. So, you know, and I'm going to scrap all of this. I'm going to start off, start all over with a different project. You know, it's, it's so easy to quit writing. And, and, and so that principle, you know, applies to me as a writer, you know, once, once I, once I um, commit to a writing project, 
you know, one, I have a deep rooted why as to why I'm doing it, um, because I want that thing to, to, to I want to finish it. And, 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 and two, you know, I, I'm not stopping, you know, there's absolutely no way I'm stopping. Like I made a commitment that I'm going to finish it and I'm going to follow it through. So it applies to everything. It applies to, to marriage. It applies to, you know, raising kids, you know, what is your deep rooted emotional reason why? Like, what is it that you want to get out of this? Like, why are you not going to quit? on your marriage why are you not going to quit on your kids so i think that principle applies to so many so many aspects of life I, you know and it's it's interesting i think it's so much easier to quit on things that yeah. are mentally challenging versus things that are physically challenging to where like it's i mean you know it's a struggle at any time but it's easier to push through sore muscles than it is yeah to, you know, when you're doubting yourself or you're doubting that something that you can do something. 100%. Um, so there is, uh, you know, you, you joined the military, you, you went through SEAL training. There's, uh, and you know, I, I'm, I'm still making my way through the book. I, I, uh, haven't quite gotten all the way through the book yet, but, um, so I'm not a hundred percent on the timeline and correct me if I'm wrong, but there was, yeah. uh, if I remember correctly, it was during SEAL training that there was another pretty transformative uh, event in your life, correct? Um, when you came to know the Lord. Yeah, 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 not yeah, man. Um, yeah, after, after I made it through SEAL training, actually. You know, after I made it through SEAL training, you know, I, I won't give it away all the way. I'll let people find out when they go get the book. <laughs> but uh, long story short, man, I, I had achieved, you know, uh, a lot of success. You know, I think, you know, becoming this graduated from SEAL training was, you know, I think that was the, the biggest accomplishment of my life at that point. And, you know, with success, you know, uh, if you're not careful, you know, it could come a lot of pride. And, uh, you know, my pride was, was, you know, let me do a lot of destruction of things and, and, and hurt a lot of people specifically women and uh long story short you know i'll uh, let people read the book to find out um, you know the details but I, I just hit rock bottom i had a rock bottom moment um and uh uh you know my brother had been a christian for a long period of time and he would tell me from time to time remy when you hit rock bottom and you've tried everything else and nothing's worked you know just remember the crowd to jesus and so uh when i hit rock bottom and i tried everything else you know to fix myself and to get rid of my guilt and the shame and all the stuff that i've been dealing with um and the depression, you know, I, I just decided to cry out to Jesus, man. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's where, uh, that, that ultimate transformation took place. You know, and it's amazing. Cause you know, you tell your story and, and, you know, people see it even more in the book, but as you go through your story, you can see so clearly how God prepared you for that transformation, you know, and especially, I mean, it's so obvious, even in just the, the metaphor you have in, in your recruiter of yeah. what she did for you uh, as a metaphor for what Christ did for all of us. I mean, yeah. you know, and I, I'm sure to some extent, you know, she was putting herself on the line no, she was. A little yeah. bit with what she, yeah. she was doing, doing for yeah. you and uh, you know, risking her neck and it's, you know, it's an amazing thing. And, you know, you have such a powerful witness, a powerful story and, you know, just everything, you know, from my time following you and, and watching, watching your different videos, things like that. Uh, you know, you really are an amazing man of God. And I just want you, to, um, you know, in my own little way, encourage you in what you're doing and say, you know, it's, it's noticed and it is encouraging to so many of us out, out here as well. Oh, thank you so much, man. Thanks for the encouragement, brother. But yeah, uh, so, you know, you went through, uh, you, you made it through your SEAL training, uh, you, you discovered Christ, you spent a lot of time overseas, 13 years, correct? Yeah, 13 years total, man. Man, that's, that's crazy. Um, I mean, you know, and I, I you know, I don't want to give away too much from the book, but uh, now how do you go from being in the military to what you're doing now from... Uh, you know, to the, the acting, to the writing, to the, the public speaking, because again, you know, I don't imagine that was the straightest of lines. Yeah. Yeah. It was a gradual process. I, uh, uh, I kind of started out speaking when I was in the SEAL teams. Um, my uh, my chief on deployment, you know, he, he recognized I was a Christian and uh, he, you know, he 
where we were getting ready to deploy to, there weren't going to be any uh, any chaplains. And so he wanted to make sure that all the checks, all the boxes were checked. And part of that was he wanted to make sure the guys had like some type of spiritual outlet. And so he tapped me to be the lay leader. So we weren't on missions on Sunday. I was leading church service. And then we weren't on missions on Wednesday. I was leading a Bible study for guys who wanted it. And, uh, and so that's where my teaching and speaking, public speaking really, really started. And, uh, you know, fast forward, when I got back from that deployment, you know, churches started reaching out to me and asking me if I would come speak. And, and then uh, uh, and I would. And then, you know, uh, speaking engagement started getting bigger. And then I started doing corporate talks and, and team talks with athletic teams, you know, um, you know, just business related and team based stuff, not, not, nothing, you know, um, spiritual related. And uh, it just kept growing and growing and growing. And when I got out of the military, my expectations was, uh, you know, I'm going to be a uh, I'm going to be a public speaker. But that didn't work out uh, as much as I did, you know, right after I got out. And, you know, so I was struggling to find out what to do. And um, I was I was considering, you know, applying for a government agency. And, and you know, that, you know, I, so I started that process. And then, you know, when, when I was in the middle of that process, I received a phone call to be in a movie. <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> it was, you know, it was just literally that easy. I was sitting at my desk writing papers for grad school and my phone rings and somebody who was in the film and TV industry asked me what I was doing the next day. And I said, nothing much for writing papers and they said hey can you come you know work on this movie the movie happened to be transformers and that one day ended up turning in six months and uh you know that's kind of how i got in the film and tv industry you know it just opened up more doors for me and again it wasn't anything i was searching for or wanted you know it just kind of came and uh but then you know how i got into writing is was through the movies um um uh, when i went to go promote transformers I was part of the press tour. I went on the Today Show and shared my story and, along with, you know, promoting the film and um, and Kathy Lee Gifford, you know, she said, you know, you need to write a book and your book needs to be made into a movie. And, and then she took me backstage and reiterated that. And, and she's the one who walked me to my publisher and got me a book deal. So I signed my book deal with the publisher and, uh, and, uh, and the rest is pretty much history, man. I, that's how I got into writing. And after I finished writing a book, I, you know, I was like, yeah, man, I love this writing thing. I want to continue it. And, uh, so that's how I got into writing screenplays and, and writing films and, and consulting on, on, on films and, and scripts and stuff like that. So that's kind of how I got into the industry, man. It was, it was never anything I was seeking to do. The Lord just kind of started to open up these doors and, you know, I just walked through them. Well, you know, and it's, it's, funny that it of course the movie was transformers because now <laughs> you've, you've kind of got this uh lifelong uh i guess affair or relationship with michael bay <laughs> yeah yeah from yeah. uh between uh between the rock and it yeah, kind of yeah, all it was, yeah. Full circle doesn't it <laughs> no absolutely totally full circle man like uh you know, it's, I think it's, it's not a coincidence that, you know, his first two films inspired me to be a SEAL. And then fast forward now, this, you know, his uh, he's the one who put me in my first movie, got my uh, second career started. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so we've already touched on this just a little bit, but I always kind of like to close out with, uh, you know, if we're, you know, if maybe, maybe you're talking with someone, uh, you know, after maybe somebody comes up to you after a speaking engagement, something like that. And they look at you and they're like, man, you know, whether it's maybe they want to, they want to be a seal. Maybe they just uh, have an aspiration to, to start a business, to do something, to go out and hunt something that they feel like is, is beyond them, that they're not qualified for, that they uh, aren't strong enough to do, that they're not smart enough to do. Um, and, you know, they're kind of telling you about this, like, you know, just maybe, maybe it's just not my thing. Um, what, what encouragement, what words of wisdom would you give someone in that, someone like that? I want to give them any encouragement. Because if you're already coming, if you have to, and this is something that, you know, I, I get a question, I get questions like that all the time from people on social media. Um, you know, um, I want to do this, but I don't know if I could do this. And I say, well, then don't do it. If you, if you don't have confidence in yourself, if you need to go to somebody else to get confidence, to do something big, chances are you, sh you shouldn't even be attempting it. You know, uh, you, you, you should never need, and this is my personal opinion. I could be completely wrong in it. It's just my personal take on it. And, uh, but you know, if you need to get encouragement from somebody to be a steel, there's no way you're going to make it through steel training. <laughs> I mean, that's just the reality of it. Um, if you need somebody to encourage you to 
because because you you know and, and let me just put it this way you know this probably help put it in the context you know when i was um when i was trained to be a seal i never trained with anybody and i, and I didn't for a reason um because and i didn't know i didn't know this but until i got to seal training but when you train with somebody you really begin to rely on them um to to push you and 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 seal training is one of those things where it, it just gets so bad that if you're looking for that person who pushed you for two weeks or three weeks or a month or however long you were training, you, that one, that person's probably going to quit. Or, or And two, they're not going to be next to you all the time. And if they're not next to you and they're not there to tell you, keep going, you're going to quit. And and you shouldn't, if you have a dream, if there's something that you, if you have a deep rooted emotional reason as to why you want to do something, you, you, you shouldn't need anybody to encourage you. You shouldn't need another seal who you go up to at a speaking engagement to say, oh yeah, you can do it. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, I would I would tell them, hey, <laughs> if they if, if they're trying to do something big that they they're not sure that they can do, and they come up to me and ask me, what do you what do you say? I'm gonna say, well, go find something else to do. And I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm just trying to be re- real because you know it, it's, the reality is, you know, you got to have confidence in yourself. I had confidence in myself when it came to to to, to being a seal. Like I was totally unqualified in every way, but. I still made the decision that, you know what, I don't care if I'm unqualified. I don't care. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. You know, it does not, I don't need anybody to tell me I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. And so that's my two cents as it relates to that. No, I, I absolutely love that. And it's, it's funny because it's one of those things to where you, you probably got two people that are, that would come up and ask you that question to where, you know, one person who, who's, probably super timid, unsure. And, you know, they may, they may walk away and it, it may be better that they don't, uh, don't do something, but then you probably got that other person that comes up and asks you and you tell them that and they're like, well, forget that guy. I'm going to do this. Like yeah. that's, it almost has the opposite effect, of, yeah. <laughs> you know, where it's like, it puts it, it kind of solidifies it in their mind. Like the second somebody tell I'm that way, yeah. like second, somebody tells me I can't do something or I'm not able to do something. Oh man, that's, I don't care if, I, I may not have wanted to do it in the first place. Yeah. So I suddenly do now. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, for sure. Yeah, 100%, but, man. Awesome. So, all right, if people wanted to find the book uh, to pick up a copy of Transformed, where can they find it? Uh, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, uh, Books a Million, Books a Million, I believe the name of it is, Indie Books, wherever books are sold, you can get it, man. Sounds good. And I'll make yeah. sure to uh, link to it on the show notes page for this episode. Yeah. Um, if people just want to follow along with uh, everything you're doing online, where can they find you? Uh, Remy at Lake, a pretty easy. I don't have the, I have a unique name, so I don't have to add the official Remy or anything like that. It's just Remy at Lake <laughs> on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. So I'm on every social media platform as Remy at Lake. Awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of a very, very busy schedule to sit down and talk with me. Um, you know, you have an amazing story. I'm really excited uh, Thank you, to finish reading the book and, uh, and check it out. Um, you know, everyone, make sure y'all pick up a, a copy of Transformed wherever books are sold. But thank you so much for hopping on today, man. No, thank you so much, brother. It's been an honor and a blessing, my man. All right, y'all, that'll do it for episode 118 of The Wild Initiative. Huge thank you to Remy for taking the time out of an incredibly busy schedule, literally wedging me in between two other speaking engagements. Make sure y'all head on over to the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com slash 118. You can check out links to everything we talked about in today's episode. You can also get a link to pick up Remy's book, Transformed. Y'all, I have been reading through this book. It is absolutely absolutely incredible it's a fantastic read it may not be a super tactical hunting book but i guarantee it's something y'all can find a ton of value out of so pick up remy adaliki's book transformed at the link on the show notes page also y'all make sure you head on over to the wildinitiative.com slash go wild check out the go wild app and see all All of the awesome things you can track to improve your time in the outdoors. And finally, make sure you head on over to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash thewildinitiative. Find out all the different ways that you can avoid commercials and join the Wild Initiative family. Alrighty, y'all. It's been fun. Looking forward to next week. But until next time, 
I hope this podcast inspired you to get involved, get outdoors, and plan your initiative for the wild. Thank you for listening to The Wild Initiative. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher and head on over to thewildinitiative.com to get show notes, check out the blog, gear discounts, other podcasts from The Wild Initiative family, and more. 